But uh, if you need something, there is no problem. Robert will. And I'll just respond in English. Sure, sure. C'est bon. <laughs> Est-ce que vous avez le souvenir, Peter, du moment où vous avez commencé à vouloir justement un peu inventer le Neo Geo, inventer cette idée de de peindre les systèmes de communication? C'était quand ça? No, um, I was born in New York, and um, uh, I went away to school, and then after I went to Yale University, I lived in New Orleans for six years. I didn't want to go back to New York during the 70s. And in 1980, I moved back to the city. And it was uh, a kind of uh, as if looking at it for the first time. And I really became fascinated with the idea of the city as a system, uh, the circulation of streets, and in New York, it's very three-dimensional. You go up and down and the subway, and it's this incredibly complex, monumental geometry. Yeah. And from that point on, the, um, the human figure seemed less important to me, and uh, the built environment yeah. seemed more important. And the thing I'm most proud of is um, my paintings in the 80s were quite simple. And for the next 20 years, they became more and more complex. And these conduits or bands began to go here, there, and everywhere in the paintings. And I like to think it sort of was a parallel to the development of communication mm -hmm. and computers and the internet mm -hmm. and the web. And certainly, 2007, 2008, it's a different, uh, completely different world in terms of communication than the 1980s. Est-ce qu'il y avait l'idée de faire des portraits finalement de la même manière que Velázquez faisait des portraits de Philippe IV d'Espagne, Warhol faisait des portraits du dollar, donc des portraits un peu de l'Amérique, et vous des portraits de la ville finalement? Portraits of the city. Uh, one could say so. In a way, New York, um, New York is both a great subject, but it's also a, a little bit of. Uh, it's still a uh, architectural space or a, a urban space that's relevant. But in fact, the one thing I gained from living in New Orleans for six years was uh, knowledge of the suburbs yeah. the, uh, and these uh, spread out cities connected by uh, super highways and the isolation of the individual houses. Mm. And in a way, that, that is the prototypical contemporary environment for mm. most people. Et l'influence de la peinture européenne ou de gens comme Albers, par exemple, qui sont euh, donc de grands peintres européens qui ont enseigné aux États-Unis, comme vous enseignez à Yale, comment vous avez fait le mélange entre les deux, justement C'est une interesting question. Uh, uh, I, I read Albers' work so early. I think I was 15 years old, and it's not quite true, but I sort of have his job at Yale. So the, the, that uh, lineage is very important to me. And for me, in fact, uh, Albers is most interesting not as a, I like his work, but really as a teacher. Right. And he really revolutionized the teaching of art in the United States mm. to teach concepts and a way of making things rather than uh, just painting paintings. Mm. And um, uh, I, I guess just as a young artist, I was naturally drawn to the history of 20th century art. But when it came to Europe, not particularly um, the neoplastic tradition. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say my favorite uh, geometric painter is Picasso. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, um, Picasso's geometry is more descriptive. Uh, by the way, most people wouldn't say Picasso was a geometric painter. Yeah. But I, I like to claim that if you think about it, 90% of his work is, the, is in fact mm. geometric vectors. Mm. And, uh, On le voit dans les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Exactly. And um, he was using geometry as a descriptive tool. And with the neoplastic painters, uh, they tend to live in this utopian world, which is a little bit lacking in uh, flesh and blood. Mm. And intuitively, I'm very drawn to Picasso and mm. Picasso of the 30s and all those 
oranges and violet and green. Mm -hmm. Il y a une chose qui est caractéristique aussi dans votre génération de peintres aux États-Unis, c'est que vous êtes un peu le seul à faire des tableaux comme ça, parce que Eric Fischer, David Salé, Jean-Michel Basquiat et même les Européens, Francesco Clemente, font tous de la peinture figurative, sauf vous. It's true. I, I'm at a loss why um, I'm the only one. And uh, I would say the people sometimes isolate geometric painting from geometry and sculpture. Mm. And if you look around at the sculpture people are making, there's quite a bit of sculpture in the geometric abstract mm. tradition. And one could say that um, geometric abstraction moved from, uh, from painting to sculpture in the 70s or 80s. Mm. Uh, at the same time, um, I'd like to say that my paintings are about a kind of structural reality behind appearance and not so much about appearance. And uh, the art world today and for the last 20 years has been very much mm. um, uh, uh, in, let's say, collaboration with the mm. spectacle, to use de Boer's term mm. of the spectacular. Mm and um, very much attached to photography, film, um, the appearance of things. Mais dans la génération d'avant, euh, justement, Barnett Newman, enfin, on vous sent plus proche de la génération d'avant euh, que de la vôtre, en fait. Yes, in a way. I mean, I grew up in New York, and my father's family is Jewish, and mm. Barnett Newman or Mark Rothko could have almost been like a mm. grandfather. And so, honestly, I feel very um, uh, much at home with their aesthetic mm. and uh, uh, their approach to abstraction. Mm. Pourtant, la génération de Warhol, c'est-à-dire celle d'après, vous les avez bien connus, parce que Warhol a fait des portraits de vous. Euh... Yes, well, my mother's family is Polish Catholic, so I have <laughs> both sides. <laughs> And in a way, that's not such a silly thing to say. I mean, artists are always synthesizing. And in a way, I think I was fortunate. Uh, before World War II, there were no Jewish artists or Catholic <laughs> artists in the United States. Mm. There's really a lot of prejudice against those groups. And in the 50s and 60s, artists of those backgrounds began to gain mm. presence on the cultural stage. Mm. And uh, so perhaps I was lucky to be able to mix Those two histories together. Hmm. On a un peu le sentiment comme collectionneur qu'en en fait il y avait un côté un peu intellectuel dans la façon dont vous faisiez des tableaux euh, au milieu des années 80-90 et dans les tableaux récents qui sont beaucoup plus flashy, on a l'impression qu'il y a presque une sorte de Peter Halley baroque. Uh, yes, this is true. Uh, and I've thought about it a lot. And um, as a young artist in the 80s, my work was didactic. I had ideas about how our work was, how our world is structured. Uh, there are very determined roadways that lead us to certain, certain end points, mm -hmm. like a highway or like the internet, and that we're stuck on those highways and that uh, this is really the underlying geometry of our society. Mm. Uh, and it controls everything. Um, after five or 10 years, it was perhaps a little bit more difficult for me to uh, continue to make the same speech as in mm. politics. Mm. And uh, like many other artists, I think I began to build on my own vocabulary. Mm. And uh, from my experience, the, the 90s in New York were a little bit depressing, especially at the beginning. The art, as you know, the art world collapsed and mm. uh, there was a lack of energy. And honestly, studying the work of the artists of the 60s, uh, Lichtenstein, Warhol, Stella, I noticed that during the 70s, when they had a, when society was kind of chaotic, they began to make works that were more and more flashy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I myself was intrigued by this sort of, uh, the, the word we use in English is counterphobic. Mm -hmm. Instead of giving into your fears, uh, uh, going against them. Comment vous avez inventé ce fond, cette matière qu'on retrouve sur tous les tableaux 
the, grumeleuse comes Yes, out. it's called Rolotex. Right. And uh, when I lived in New Orleans and I would visit my friends who lived in uh, condominiums in the suburbs, yeah. it was everywhere, covering the ceilings, the walls. It was the ubiquitous American building material. Mm. And uh, for me, it started as a kind of uh, complicated joke that uh, uh, especially in New York, paintings always had their characteristic texture. Mm. Um, a Rothko w had the very thin paint, or uh, a de Kooning was like mm. that. And so I thought it was kind of interesting to use a mechanical texture, a texture, a texture that a painter just rolls on uh, mm. when they're uh, finishing a room. Mm. And also at that time I was beginning to play with Baudrillard's idea of simulation. So it's not real texture, it's a simulated texture. Mm -hmm. So it all came together. Vous travaillez avec des assistants? Yes. Uh, two or three artists helped me in the studio. Yeah. Um, what I do is uh, I work alone. Um, actually not at my studio, I stay at home and make drawings. Yeah. And then I bring them to the studio. And these paintings are very time consuming to make. There's a lot of taping and the paint is applied in... Very delicate. Well, many coats also, mm. especially the thicker areas. And um, it's, uh, it's almost like a, um, a traditional atelier of somebody who mm. makes furniture with um, a veneer or a lacquer. So I need people to help me, or otherwise I would be back at my studio painting and not. Vous vous considérez Peter comme un peintre ou comme un artiste? Hmm. Well, I think the word artist is uh, is more useful these days. People go back and forth, and even if one is a painter, um, one, one's work. Uh, is, is perceived in a, a field where people do other things. Mm. On the other hand, uh, I can't do anything else. <laughs> I don't actually uh, see very well in three dimensions. Mm. And the joke I make in English is some of my best friends are sculptors, <laughs> but the problems are very different. Mm. And one of the fascinating things, or the important things about being a painter today is, you know, we live in a world of images and paintings are also images, and it is a way to have a dialogue or, uh, in some cases, a critique mm. with this mm. world of images we live in. Est-ce que vous vous êtes dit de temps en temps, je vais sortir du monde que j'ai créé C'est-à-dire, il n'y aura plus que Peter Halley va tout d'un coup totalement changer. I have thought about that, but um, in fact, the fact, in fact, I think that um, my very small vocabulary at this point is important. And I only have three or four elements to work with. A center form, a cell or prison, yeah. these conduits connecting it. Uh, there, in a way you could say there's three or four variables in the language. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to think about if you can continue to work with such a small vocabulary and, and continue to speak. Mm. The thing that is added to that is color, and I think, in fact, my color changes all the time. Mm. So that is, is in fact, uh, not so much always the same. Um, nowadays, when I speak with my students or other artists, artists really feel like uh, often that each piece involves a new idea, a new problem, mm. or something like that. And honestly, that's foreign to me. And the perception, the, um, that way of thinking has changed. When I was a student, people might admire Cezanne, or Rothko, or Morandi, all these painters who never changed anything, mm. <laughs> I'm sure that you spoke about. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was easy. <laughs>